The following interview was conducted with uh, John, Professor John F. McLaughlin, Professor Emeritus of Civil Engineering for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Wednesday, August the 5th, 2009 at his residence in West Lafayette. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Welcome, Dr. McLaughlin. Thank nice you. to have you here. Okay, thank you. Tell us a little about where you were born and your parents in early years. I was born in New York City in uh, September of 1927 and grew up uh, in New York. They moved to uh, Queens, Astoria, uh, shortly after I was born. And I went to elementary school in, in Queens. And then I went to uh, Stuyvesant High School in downtown Manhattan. Graduated in uh, January of 1944. And the war was on, and I enlisted and uh, spent some time in college with the auspices of the Army Air Corps. And uh, was. You can sit back, we're fine. Yeah, I know. Was discharged uh, in uh, uh, late 19. No, in January of 1947. Uh, did Saturday. you serve in the just in the in the U.S. or did? No, I was uh, I was very fortunate. I uh, served most of my time uh, in uh, in Hickam Field in Hawaii, which was uh, good duty. And then I went to school in uh, Syracuse University. Graduated in 1950. Came out here to Purdue as a graduate assistant in September of 1950 was made an instructor in 1951 and went on from there. Okay. What was the campus like when you came? And tell yeah. us a little about when you arrived. Well, it were was... You, you were married by that time, huh? No, oh. we got married out here, actually. Okay. Uh, Eleanor joined me out here in uh, 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 November of 1950, and we were married in St. Mary Cathedral, as a matter of fact. The campus was on the down slope of enrollment at that time, uh, most of the G.I. Bulge had graduated and left. I think there were about 9,000 students total on campus in uh, the fall of 1950. Uh, housing was very difficult to find, but uh, uh, we found a, a room in a real flea bag in downtown Lafayette and uh, stayed there for a while after we were married moved over to uh, Gross 8 Apartments in 1951, and that was a very pleasant change. Mm -hmm. what, how did you happen to select Purdue for your graduate work? Uh, I had a faculty member at Syracuse in the areas that I was interested in uh, who had joined Syracuse from the University of California at Berkeley, and he recommended uh, that I go for a master's degree either to Purdue, the University of Virginia, or Wisconsin. I applied and was accepted at all three, and uh, the uh, program looked stronger and better at Purdue, and so I came here. Good. Okay, fine. Now, then your uh, original thing, and then you start on your research, let's talk about your <coughs> responsibilities, and this is in c civil engineering. I was in civil engineering. I worked under the direction of Professor William Getz, who was a faculty member in civil engineering in the area of uh, construction materials. He was my mentor for many years. I got a PhD degree in January of 1957 and was offered a position on the faculty here and several other places, but I stayed right here okay. and was never uh, sorry for that decision. Okay. Sometimes they say that they suggested that you might want to go somewhere else, but it worked out best for you. Did it you did stay? indeed, uh -huh. yes. I had several other offers, but uh, then and, and later, but uh, it was always better here. Right, okay. Um, now, now that you're there and you were... Uh, in 1958, you became head of the Department of Transportation Engineering. Uh, that's correct. Okay. In, in the School of Civil Engineering. That's correct. Right. Okay. Tell us a little about that. And then when you became assistant mm. head in... Well, Purdue was very strong in the area of uh, transportation engineering. And uh, uh, a faculty member 
who was the head of that area, left and went to Northwestern. And the head of civil engineering at that time was Professor K.B. Woods, who uh, dropped into my office one day and said, John, you're it. And so I said, fine, and took over. And then what? Uh, what would te what tell them for the research? What transportation engineering was a, a sub discipline within the civil well, sub discipline within okay. civil engineering. There was okay. transportation engineering and structural engineering and sanitary engineering and some others. Mm -hmm. But my area was transportation engineering. Okay. And then let's say now now you've mm -hmm. moved on, moved up to assistant head. Tell the, us about the uh, transcription there. Professor K. B. Woods uh, withdrew as head of civil engineering in 1950, excuse me, uh, 59 or 60, I forget the year, mm -hmm. but uh, Jerry Leonards, who was professor of civil engineering in the area of geotechnical engineering, became head of civil engineering. Oh, I remember, it was 1965. And he uh, asked me to be assistant head and I said yes, and was assistant head of civil engineering from 1965 to 1968. Okay. At which point, Dr. Leonard's decided that he no longer wanted to be head of civil engineering and uh, went back to teaching and research. There was a search for a head of the School of Civil Engineering, and I was named head in... Uh, July 1968. Okay. For the researchers, was the search process at that time is what it is today? Did no, they have a search it was committee? nothing like it at all. Okay. Uh, a couple of people, uh, senior members of the faculty got together. They got some outside input from uh, some civil engineering heads from other leading schools of civil engineering like Illinois and uh, Berkeley and they made their decision, and that was it. Okay, so there was there mostly was no, even in terms. no advertising. Uh, I don't think that, uh, we might have interviewed some outside candidates, but not many. Okay, okay. Well then tell us a little about when you were the head, what were some of the initiatives and your responsibilities, well, challenges? There was quite a, quite a challenge. Uh, at the time I became head, the curriculum in civil engineering was very, very highly structured with practically no electives, and it was uh, uh, not one that allowed for much initiative and flexibility. And one of my principal concerns was making it a more flexible and attractive and yet a strong curriculum because of several things. I thought the one that we had was archaic and the uh, our enrollment had dropped precipitously uh, in absolute terms and certainly vis-a-vis -vis all the other schools of engineering and we were in we were in tough shape at that time. Okay. We had uh, a couple of years study and changed the curriculum remarkably. Uh, I think that it served as a model for many other schools throughout the country to follow and our enrollment became, uh, our program became more attractive. Our enrollment increased, and we went from 200 students to 400, 450, and okay. we were again a viable force within the schools of engineering. Okay. What was the job market for the students at that time when you took over? It was always good. Okay. Yeah. We never had a problem with the job market. Okay, okay. Uh, and the Dean of Engineering at that time was Hawkins, <coughs> right? George Hawkins? The Dean of Engineering was George Hawkins. No. When you... Uh, when I became head of civil engineering, the Dean was Dick Grosch. Oh, okay. Hawkins had moved out into academic vice president at that time. Okay, okay. And then I guess the next thing is became the Assistant Dean of Engineering when Cliff Gert Gertie retired, huh? In about 77? Uh, no. Uh, I don't think Gertie retired oh, okay. at that time. Okay. But Hancock was Dean of Engineering at that time, mm -hmm. and he asked me to come over without portfolio, and uh, I went over there as a Assistant Dean of Engineering while I was still half-time. Uh, well, I was half-time in the Dean's office and remained half-time as Head of Civil Engineering. That was in 19... 
78, I think. Okay, okay. And uh, That's a challenge with the two of them there. You had two offices, huh? Oh, it certainly was, yes. <laughs> but they weren't that far apart. No. <laughs> and then you moved up uh, to associate dean in 1980. Yeah. Uh, Gertie retired. Uh, I forget. Marion Scott was uh, another right. associate dean. Mm -hmm. Bob Greencorn and I were associate deans, and uh, we split the responsibilities. And well, we, we we didn't delineate specifics all that much. Bob took care of most of the research. I took care of most of the academic matters other than research, and Marion Scott uh, did other things. Okay, okay, so, and then, uh, then I guess John, you became acting dean, uh, was it, in 84? I about? forget the year, but okay. yeah, I became acting dean. Let's see, uh, John Hancock uh, left to go s in, into industry, mm -hmm. and uh, I was asked to be acting dean, and I spent, uh, what was it, 84? Yeah, yeah 84, to 84. About January to June or thereabouts, yeah, I think. I was, what act, had here. I was acting dean. Right. Some challenges involved there? Surely. Uh, now, were we, they moving in the area of the search committees at that time or not? Oh, yeah. Okay. The search committees were, were in vogue, and uh, there were lots and lots of candidates reviewed both on paper and in person for the position of dean of engineering. And we had some good people come through here, and for reasons uh, of uh, their interest in ours, uh, a couple of offers were made, and it finally devolved into Henry Yang being offered the position, and he accepted and became Dean of Engineering in, I guess it was 1985. Okay, okay, all right. Then there was another time when there was a vacancy and uh, you were the interim dean in 94. Yeah, I was all set to retire in uh, June of 94 and Henry Yang decided that he wanted to be president of the university somewhere and he interviewed in lots of different places and he was offered the position of, I guess it's chancellor in the University of California system at Santa Barbara, and he accepted that position and left in uh, 1994. And when he announced his resignation in the spring of 94, Bob Ringel asked me to stay on for a year, although I had announced my retirement. And after some soul searching and Somewhat reluctantly, I will admit, said, okay, I'll do it. And so I stayed on as acting dean from uh, 1994 to June of 1995. Mm, okay, and during that time, the search went on, and then, and then they, uh, Dick during Schwartz came. During that time, the search went on, Right. and Dean Schwartz became dean in uh, 1995. Okay, okay. Um, how is the schools of engineering have changed a lot over yeah, time? Yeah, they sure and, have. And since your involvement, particularly a lot on the administrative, any comments or observations? First, and even now, the freshman engineering has changed a lot. Oh, since I left, it's changed radically. All right. I wouldn't. I don't recognize it anymore. There are lots and lots of uh, assistant and associate deans. There are more departments than there were when I left, they've changed to the College of Engineering. And uh, for, for many years, uh, it was me and the dean, and we did most all of it. Right, exactly. And, uh, during your time, it was when the Potter Building was built? During, yeah. Uh -huh. Okay, and I think for the researchers, just make a couple comments about that, and particularly how they consolidate all the libraries. Because at one time, all your schools had separate all libraries. All the schools had separate libraries. There was one in civil engineering and uh, I guess all Egypt, of them, all of double them, E yeah. and, air, and industrial <coughs> and yeah. aero, right. And then they were all amalgamated in, to the engineering library in Potter. Right, exactly. And Dean Potter was still alive, wasn't he, at that time? Yes, Dean Potter was alive and well for 
many of the years that I was in the dean's office, and he would come by periodically, and we'd have some conversation and chat about his time at Purdue, and it was quite interesting. Did he make any comments? Because we can't interview Dean Potter, but no. uh, it was kind of a, I mean, been there for what, since 1922 or something, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Oh, he, uh, he was, I, I think. When you came, was he, had he stepped down or was he still active? Let me think. I guess he was he was still active when okay. I got here in 1950. Okay. But uh, I guess, in the most constructive sense of the word, he was autocratic. I mean, he ran the show, and uh, I think that was the way it was with most of the administration at Purdue at that time. It was a very uh, administrative-centered administration. The faculty had their prerogatives, but there were also uh, guidelines that uh, one had to observe. Mm -hmm. What was the promotion and tenure <coughs> process at that time? It's not as, not as it is today. Well, it was not as structured as it is today. Uh, I, I'm, sh I'm sure they had committees, uh, promotion committees of the senior faculty in each of the schools, but uh, they they got together and made their decisions and that was it. Right. So. I've heard from people such as yourself that <laughs> it was a lot easier then. Well, it was a lot easier for the people who were making the decisions, that's <laughs> for sure. It may not have been easier on the people <laughs> who were being promoted. <laughs> oh, a couple things on the College of Engineering. One is on your diversity and there were minority programs. You really had quite a few of those going. We sure did. And we had some good people working on that. Mm -hmm. I remember working uh, a lot with Marion Blaylock, who was head of the uh, uh, Minority Engineering Program in the Schools of Engineering. She was well regarded nationally and did a lot to build up the uh, Minority Program in mm -hmm. Engineering. What about the Women in Engineering Program? Did that, had that been going be all those times or even well, beforehand? Well, that, that also took off during John Hancock's administration, as did the uh, Minority Engineering mm -hmm. Program, and that was headed by uh, uh, Jane Daniels, yeah. who was another uh, active person, uh, parallel to Marion Blaylock in the Minority Program, and she developed very many uh, good programs that attracted women. Our, our undergraduate enrollments by, uh, of women went, I, ca I can't remember the numbers, but we went from you know one or two in the whole uh, school of, uh, schools of engineering to almost 22, 23 well, percent. That's pretty which good. Which is quite a, quite a Quite a leap, that's right. Quite a yeah. leap. Yeah, another comment or question I have is about the <coughs> rankings. You know that have really come yeah. before U.S. News and World Report yeah, and yeah, the yeah. rankings, and uh -huh. uh, there's a lot of pluses and you know discussion on that. Yep, there sure was, and yeah. still is. Yeah, that's right. Okay, uh, 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 alumni support been pretty good over the years. You got a well, uh, alumni support was practically non-existent when I first came here. Okay. In fact, uh, it was not really encouraged to go and beat the bushes for alumni support. When I was head of civil engineering, there were many things that uh, I thought would be great to add to the program that needed some outside funding and thought that I would approach alumni to do it. But frankly, and without naming names, I was told that Purdue did not go begging for alumni support. Okay. Was there an advancement or development like there is today at that time? Not Nothing at all. like none Nothing whatsoever. Like that. Okay. Nope. Uh, what about advisory committees? Do the schools and engineering have an uh, outside advisory committee like many of the industrial committees uh, you have now? That, that developed uh, in a structured way uh, after I became head of civil engineering. That there were you know people who were known to the faculty who could give advice and whatever. But as far as having a named and uh, structured advisory committee. 
that's a phenomenon that dates from the, oh, I guess, uh, the early 70s. Okay. We had, a, we had an engineering visiting committee, I think beginning in, with, uh, with John Hancock's administration. Okay. Okay. Yeah, we had a lot of good people in that, including right. Neil, Neil Armstrong. Right. That brings up another thing I wanted to ask about is the uh, the DEA program, the Distinguished yeah. Engineering. Tell uh -huh. us, for the researchers, tell us a little about that, which is continues on today. I forget who started that program. I think it might have been Professor Woods in Civil Engineering and Grosch as Dean. But uh, I forget how the idea developed, mm -hmm. but it uh, certainly dated back to uh, the early, late 60s, early 70s. And uh, uh, the uh, method of selection followed sort of the promotions committee model, and nominations were made, and resumes were reviewed and all that sort of thing. Right, yeah. Yeah, yeah it worked out very well, too. It used to be uh, held in the spring, <coughs> but now they've moved it to Engineers Week. which It is was held in the spring mm -hmm. uh, during Gala Week. Right. And we, uh, well, that Gala Week was a real three-ring three circus at that time because we'd have the DEAs and the visiting committee and whatever all that weekend and by the time Monday rolled around, you felt like you had to go into therapy to get over it. Stop the world, I want to get off, right? I bet you. <laughs> oh. <laughs> How about the placement on your years in the engineering? Graduate placement was really pretty good for the graduates over time, or were there peaks and valleys as far as the job market? Well, there were peaks and valleys, sure. but it was, never, it was never one where people went begging. Uh, you know, a valley was where somebody had to work hard to get an offer, but had one. The peaks were when you had five offers and had to uh, choose among them. That's right, which is not easy to do. Not, in, <laughs> not at all. Oh, uh, you got quite a few awards and honors. Um, you're a fellow of the American Society of Civil Engineering yes. and American Concrete Institute, and you got an honorary membership, and you also served as president. I did. Yeah. I served on the, I served on the board for a number of years, and vice president and president of the American Concrete Institute and then an honorary member of that organization. I'm a fellow of the uh, American Society for Testing and Materials mm -hmm. and a fellow of the American Society of Civil Engineers and what else? Something or other in Chi Epsilon. Were you ever a fact fellow at any of Yeah, I oh. was. I was okay. a fact fellow for one semester, no, for one year at, uh, I think it was Owen Hall. Okay. And uh, I, I didn't do a very good job at that because I traveled a lot and really uh, couldn't put the time in on it. Right, yeah. So after working at it and trying to work at it for a year, I decided I couldn't continue. Sure, that. that's right. Okay. One of the nice things that you got was the President's Medal. Yes, I yes. got that. Was that, did that come as, sometimes I ask people, was that kind of a surprise? And Absolute, how did it come about? Uh, it was a That's luncheon. a very special, for research, that's a very special Purdue Award. There are very few of them. Yes, there are. Uh, Fred Ford, John McLaughlin, and I forget who else. Oh, I'll have to find out. But anybody, anyhow, I was... Call, you better call Fred, and he may, he may know who number three is. <laughs> yeah. uh, I was at a luncheon. It was at a luncheon. Uh, I think it might have been a distinguished engineering alumnus luncheon and Steve Beering was there. We were at the same table and uh, I forget what the occasion was. It was very close to the time I was scheduled to retire and uh, he got up to make some remarks after the luncheon and he said, now I'd like to make a special award and called upon me and gave me this award. Isn't that nice? It added completely out of the, didn't know the award, the award existed. I've got a little medallion in there, a little sure. statue in there that uh, 
That's nice. Yeah, it is yeah, very that's nice. That's very nice. Very special. Yeah. Do, you, do you still keep in touch with any of your professional associations? Do you still get the newsletters or the magazines? Oh, sure. I America? get... Uh, American, American Society of Engineering Education and the Indiana Society of Professional Engineers. You uh, no, I, I have a member of, of okay. those, but uh, what I do get regularly is... Uh, information from the American Society of Civil Engineers mm -hmm. and uh, I'm still uh, get all the information from the American Concrete Institute the board minutes and this and that but sure uh, I, I can't go to meetings any longer so I'm, I'm kind of out of touch. All right. What about the road show for the researchers mm -hmm. make a couple because that kind of mm -hmm. is the road show the highway road show that's held in civil Engineering, well, still we, going. The, uh, we don't have a we don't have much of a road show anymore, but uh, the Purdue Road School yeah, has been going on since forever, and uh, that was started. Ooh, back in the twenties, I think. That's what I understand. And yeah. uh, a gentleman by the name of Ben Petty was the chairman of that thing for many, many, many years. He was a professor of civil engineering. At Purdue? At Purdue, yeah. Okay. And uh, he, was, he was one of the first people in civil engineering who really uh, developed an outreach program with engineers in the State Highway Commission and uh, throughout the counties in Indiana. Ran this road school for many years and had a we had a road show uh, in conjunction with it that uh, uh, was housed in the armory for many years, and that became a rather uh, expensive and cumbersome operation, and it uh, faded away, but not until several years after Petty retired. And I became chairman of the road school. Mm -hmm. as a yeah, I was going to. I saw that. Yeah, and uh, I ran that for many years, and the road show sort of took a, a minor place in that in that operation. The road school, uh, traditionally and because of space, uh, was held during spring break, and uh, we took over practically took over the, the Union Club. Mm -hmm. And then later on when uh, Stewart Center was built, we had many of our, many of our uh, programs in Stewart Center during road school week. It was a, it was a whole week when, when I was running it. Mm -hmm. Now it's two or three days. Sure. But it, it brings in people from all over the state, uh, Highway Commission, County engineers, county road supervisors, surveyors, commissioners. It it is a good outreach program. Sure, and the reason it's at Purdue is because the Purdue professor is the one that got it started. Yeah, so right. that's why I was here. Yeah, it got started under Potter. Actually. Right. Okay. Um, let's talk a little about your family. Yeah. Your children. Uh, uh -huh. Did any? Did they go to Purdue? And what are their? Where are uh, they now? Well, I have four children. Okay. Two boys, two girls. Uh, the oldest of the four is Susan McLaughlin. She's a graduate of the uh, School of Veterinary Medicine. Uh, is a, a diplomat of the uh, whatever you call it in ophthalmology for veterinarians. She worked for a while at Auburn University and is now on the faculty of the. Purdue School of Veterinary Medicine. Number two is Donald McLaughlin. He's a Purdue Civil Engineering graduate. Uh, got a master's at University of Massachusetts and a PhD out of Arizona State. He's a computer science uh, PhD. And number three is uh, a young lady by the name of Cynthia who was a uh, enrolled in the Kreinert School as an undergraduate, got married just before completion and so didn't stay around and get a degree. She is now married and lives in Indianapolis. Number four, Kevin McLaughlin is a chemical engineering graduate from Purdue University. 
a PhD from the University uh, from Texas University of Texas at Austin, and uh, he works in Austin in the computer industry. Okay, sounds good. Now we move on to retirement activities. After you retire, yeah. what did you? What came next? Well, what came next was a shock. The day I was leaving for my retirement party, June thirtieth of nineteen. 95, I was halfway out the door and the telephone rang and I had a call from my family physician who said that you have failed the PSA test. And so I spent the next many months in radiation therapy and that took care of my retirement plans for many years. You don't have to include this, but that, a, that, uh, that took us it, yeah. That took care of things. Yeah. Um, but you had you had, a, had you already decided you were going to stay in the Lafayette area? Oh yeah. yeah okay. okay. Uh, we had purchased a house <clears throat> on a lake about thirty miles from Auburn, Alabama, and it was our plan to uh, stay in Lafayette during the summers. It's during the, yeah during the during the summers, and at our lake house in Alabama during the winters. So when I finished up with this radiation therapy. Uh, we executed that plan, and mm -hmm. for the next, oh, I guess it was nine years, uh, did that. Spent uh, summers in Indiana and winters in Alabama. Okay. And you saw you you don't you don't have the house anymore. We have the house, but after nine or ten years, I was unable to uh, sure. continue that travel, so I became housebound. And, okay. And here I am. Oh, sounds. Uh, do you have a uh, couple things? How about a favorite? Do you have a Purdue tradition that you'd like to share with us? Purdue tradition. A tradition, football or the Boilermaker special or commencement? Uh, or commence, commencement was always a high point. I went to lots of commencements, but I guess uh, my favorite was uh, outside of the academic side. We went to <clears throat> every football game in in the season for the first. 30-some years I was here, and basketball the same, but I'm unable to do that anymore. But we follow Purdue sports very closely. No, the, the, the tradition is that uh, I like it here. I like Purdue. Somebody accused me of bleeding black and gold, and okay, I do. I'm with you on that. How about an outstanding event? Do you have anything that you'd like to share with us? Not really. Okay. Do, and in closing, any as you look back and look ahead, any comments that you'd like to wrap up with? Well, I think Purdue has uh, a tradition of uh, uh, a very strong work ethic. Our graduates seem to uh, have this ethic built into them during their four or five or more years at Purdue, and they're, uh, they're successful. They, they sometimes become company presidents, but they're always uh, <clears throat> successful contributors to whoever they work for, and they, they make their mark, and that, that's something to be proud of. That's right, yeah, that's very nice. Yeah. I want to thank you very much, Dr. Malone. It's been a pleasure to talk thank to you. Thank you very much. Okay. Love you too. Okay.